Good morning or good evening, depending on when you're tuning in. And thank you for joining us for our third From the Field episode of FP Next, bringing you updates straight from the farm field. I'm one of your co-hosts, Sarah McNaughton-Peterson, and I'm here with Kurt Arns. Hi, Sarah. Yes, we're excited to share the latest insights uh, from fields all across the country with our listeners. And uh, we're heading to the I states and beyond with our guest today, right? Absolutely. And since we are three episodes into this series, and I was thinking about something I'd like to see, Kurt, I would like some people in the comments on YouTube sharing what's been happening in their neck of the woods. You know, we can get a lot of ground covered virtually here, but we can't get everywhere. And so if um, you're listening into this and you want us to share what's happening on your farm, leave it in the comments so Kurt and I can get a little bit more insight about what's happening around the country. Yeah, it'd be cool to, to see, you know, from all of our listeners all across the country, uh, how field conditions are in their own neck of the woods. But for today, let's introduce our guest, uh, Madison Wozniak, who's an agronomist with FMC. And while she resides in Indiana, she covers a lot bigger territory than that. So, you know, we'll let her talk a little bit about that. But w Madison, welcome to FP Next. Hey, thank you for having me. <laughs> So why don't you give us just a little bit of back, background of you, you know, your area, kind of the area that you cover, and just some initial ground conditions right now. Sure, absolutely. So I guess for starters, uh, I'm Madison Wozniak. I'm an agronomist uh, covering southwestern Indiana, the bottom two-thirds of Illinois, and all of eastern Missouri. Now, I live here in southwestern Indiana. We farm in this region. Um, my usual stomping grounds are in the southern portion of my territory, so I'll, I'll speak uh, largely about that district, but, you know, I'll kind of encompass everything where I can. Um, so, yeah, as, a, as an agronomist with FMC, if, if folks aren't familiar, we're an agricultural chemical company, an American-based company, and we don't have any ties to seeds. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm, you know, walking fields, um, helping make recommendations, whether it's on herbicides, fungicides, or insecticides, um, helping, you know, uh, figure up what needs to be done in situations where we've got issues or if things went wrong, you know, what exactly went wrong trying to come to uh, the conclusion of the issue. And not only that, I kind of get to, uh, I have a unique role where I get to work with the universities, a couple of them in Illinois, to help develop protocols and see those protocols through, roll up that data and share it with my sales team as well as with the growers. So uh, I really enjoy uh, what I get to do on a daily basis. But as for how things are looking across my territory this year, I think uh, my dad said it best. He said, you know, Madison, I don't see the vast uh, regions that you do across the tri-state area. He said, but as for Decker Farms, this has been the most troublesome spring I can ever recall. And I think that that sentiment was shared with large swaths of growers across, across the Southern district of my uh, territory. We could not miss a rain to save our life this spring. So um, it's been incredibly wet. And uh, in spite of that, things have kind of changed the last two weeks. The sun finally started shining. We got some heat. We got a break from the rain, and the crop has really started to look uh, pretty good. So um, had you asked me how things looked down here three weeks ago, I probably would have said not great, pretty yellow, kind of runty. Uh, <laughs> but once, we, once the summer started finally acting like summer, oh, man, things turned around within three days, turning green, blowing through vegetative stages, uh, you know, edging on canopy closure. So, um, you know, I would say for the most part, things look good. Uh, I wouldn't use the term excellent. Now, there are some areas or some pockets that do look excellent or great, um, but the, the, the majority of everything just looks good. Um, and I would say about the same percentage of fields that look excellent, there's also an equal percentage of fields that look poor to very poor. So everything across the southern portion of my territory is just extremely variable uh, given the extreme precipitation events that we got uh, all, all spring. <laughs> so. It's always either like not enough rain or too much rain. And I think a lot of the farmers we visited with have talked about that insane variability that's happening this season. But what do you think the outlook's going to be for the rest of the year? You know, do you think there's going to be any like issues because of that rain or like more disease coming in? Like what's, what's kind of your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So just looking at things today without like future issues in the equation, I am optimistic. I am an optimist, but I'm also a realist. So given the fact that things have really turned around the last two weeks, 
Um, I, I think we're on track for, for to be pleasantly surprised about the corn crop. Um, we know that given our late planting dates, we, we already lost our top end yield potential on the soybeans. So any day that we planted after May 15th, we started losing top end yield potential. But uh, if we stay in this, this wet tract, which it looks like we, we might, at least within the 10 day forecast, um, if we can put out flowers, retain those flowers, fill those pods, we might not be too glum about our soybean yields either. But as for issues that, you know, maybe I'm looking out for, particularly in this region where we were, we were planted really late. Um, late planted crops, you need to be more leery about uh, a disease pressure in those late planted crops. There's a few, few reasons for that. Um, one, the pathogens have more time to build inoculum um, throughout the duration of the season. Uh, two, we are going to be going through really important yield preserving or uh, yield retaining uh, growth stages at the same time that the environmental conditions start to change. You know, things start to look a little bit different environmentally come late summer and early fall. And that happens to coincide with conditions that are favorable for disease pressure. So one of the things that I'm urging growers to think about is like, hey, I know that we weren't feeling super great about how we got the crop in the ground, but we did get it in the ground and it was late. So we need to start being mindful of the things uh, that are going to try to chip away at our yield uh, later this season when we're going through really, really important uh, yield preserving stages. So, uh, you know, don't give up hope. You put all this effort into getting the crop in with this terrible spring. Uh, you know, don't, don't give up the fight to something that we can control. You know what I, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> You talked a little bit about, you know, what planning conditions were like, uh, you know, and that you, you kind of got a slow start. I mean, can you elaborate a little bit more? Were, were we talking about flooded fields that, you know, where stuff was just underwater or what was, you know, the extent of that? Absolutely. We had flooding events, especially in river bottom ground, but even, even in ground that, you know, doesn't fall within a, a <laughs> right next to a river. So we were we were getting large large rainfall events probably every like four to seven days so just when we thought we would have a break to plant into ideal conditions um, uh, we were getting another large rainfall event so there were pockets of fields that were completely flooding out really really uneven emergence and uneven stands uh, to the point where you know a lot of it ended up being touched up or completely reset right so um, it, if we were planting into ideal conditions, which I would, I would guess that most growers would say they weren't planting into I ideal conditions, but if they were, uh, unfortunately, usually the next day we were getting just an incredible amount of rainfall, which would, which would then cause issues with, uh, emergence, as you know, um, <laughs> resulting in things needed to be touched up. So we're actually deviating from the 30 year normals by anywhere from five to 11 inches, depending on where you are within my territory. Now, if you look at central Illinois and bordering on Northern Illinois, they're wishing they were getting a rain. So, um, Maybe I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, we were hating the rain for a little while, but I think we're going to continue to welcome it with open arms. But we do have to be mindful about, you know, what that means for uh, disease proliferation. So, um, yeah, and we can kind of get into that if you want. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you're a little mind reader. Got a crystal ball or something we always talk about. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the next question. We want to talk about, like, the biggest concerns you're going to see for the rest of the season, you know, whether it's weeds um, especially those diseases we already talked a little bit about, or like any insects, like what are you expecting the big kind of issues going to be affecting that crop? Yeah, well, the current issue right now is still the weeds. So, you know, if we couldn't get out to plant, we we weren't getting out there to spray in a, in a timely fashion, right? So a lot of um, our really, really robust uh, pre-emergence herbicides that have to be put on as a true pre, so the crop cannot be up, we had to end up shelving because we couldn't get those pre-emergent herbicides on in a timely manner, right? And regardless of your, your flavor of uh, soybean trait technology, the one thing that's, that's common is the fact that we, most of us, can utilize glufosinate, whether it's an extend or an enlist system. And so almost every single acre is relying heavily on glufosinate. And we all know the story about Roundup and how we, we used and abused that technology to the point that we rendered it ineffective on some of our more troublesome weeds. Well, you know, I'm just 
give, putting out a word of caution, I guess, to growers that it, it really does look like we're doing the same exact thing with our glufosinate technologies, given the fact that we can't utilize dicamba posts uh, in soybeans currently. So um, in this situation, I'm making sure to remind growers, let's put that re overlapping residual in with our, with our post product. Um, from our portfolio, if you're familiar with Anthem Max, this is a product that can go on pre or post in corner beans. It's going to provide excellent residual activity on small seeded broad leaves like water hemp and palmer, as well as your grasses. So adding something like that into the tank to help, you know, take the pressure off of our post technologies is ultimately going to benefit us in the long run. Hopefully can carry us out to canopy closure so we don't have any more of those weed troubles. <laughs> um, but looking forward, we had mentioned this before we started recording, tar spots being confirmed seems like earlier and earlier every year. And I, I don't think that this should be too much of a surprise moving forward. We know that tar spot overwinters in our soils. We know that it likes cooler conditions, so 60 to 70 degrees, and it likes leaf wetness. And we've had plenty of that uh, this growing season up until the last two weeks, at least in my territory. Um, so we were confirming tar spot in mid-June uh, in the upper portions of Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. That's something that we're going to have to be vigilant of even down in the southern portion of Indiana. Uh, last year, we saw tar spot move in early and really aggressively in southern Indiana, and this caught a lot of growers off guard. Uh, we thought that we were so far south that we wouldn't have to deal with tar spot in the same capacity that growers in central to northern Indiana and Illinois did. And we were sorely mistaken. It started moving in around V10 and, and guys were really, really struggling to, to keep on top of it after that. So um, given that we have a late planted crop and those environmental conditions are probably going to turn conducive for disease at some point, uh, we want to remain, we want to remain vigilant of that one. Right now, since it's so hot, it's not, it's not really favorable for tar spot. So it's not at the top of my mind currently, but things like gray leaf spot, uh, it does like the warm weather and it does like the moisture. So um, even though that's one we see every year, I think we underestimate it, but it's one to keep, to keep uh, at the top of our mind as well. You know, uh, Madison in our country in Nebraska, uh, tar spot showed up earlier than ever before this season and uh you know we don't help ourselves because we have a ton of irrigation out here and so that kind of makes the conditions even better for it so there was a little panic uh earlier on when it started showing up so fast you know so it's just yep. uh, going to be an issue for all of us i think moving forward right absolutely and i do urge growers if, if they if they do irrigate you're artificially creating the perfect environment for tar spot you're keeping it moist and you're keeping that canopy cool um so if if you know you've had a history of tar spot and you know you irrigate uh, go to the fields where you know you've seen it before go to the fields where you know you're irrigating um, a couple of things that I could mention from our portfolio that, you know, you know are things for you know, people to take into consideration. It's a little bit late uh, for this product unless, unless people are still wide dropping or side dressing, which is definitely, we're at the, the latter end of it in my territory, but some of it's still occurring. We have a product called Zyway, and traditionally, uh, this is a fungicide, it's put on with the planter at the time of planting. And it's very, very persistent in the soil and extremely systemic throughout the plant. And it's labeled for control of gray leaf spot in northern corn leaf blight, as well as suppression of tar spot. So we're not making control claims, but it is going to help hold it off. Uh, one of the benefits of using a tool like that is, is suppressing something as, as aggressive as tar spot so you can be more timely with that foliar fungicide. We know that we don't want to pull the trigger too early because those foliar fungicides absolutely don't last forever. Um, something new about Zyway, we actually just got a label amendment, a 2 E, so that you can apply it in a side dress application up to V6, 15 inches off the row. Purdue did the research for us, and they weren't able to come to any conclusions that showcased that side dressing uh, provided any different performance against tar spot or yield preservation uh, when we applied it in a side dress application versus a 2x2 two two application. So if guys have a history of concern with tar spot and they want to do something that will hold off those early onset diseases like gray leaf spot and be more timely with their foliar fungicide, uh, Zyway has a play there. And it can be wide dropped as late as V8. Um, for folks where that, that isn't a player in the game, 
We did launch a new foliar fungicide uh, just this last season called Adastrio, and it is going to be right on par with some of the best tar spot chemistries that we have on the market. It's also going to provide control of southern rust, northern corn leaf blight, and gray leaf spot. That product's called Adastrio. I'm not sure if I mentioned the name. So. <laughs> I know we talk a lot about ag technologies. I think one of the things people always think of is it's like, oh, like the cool screens and the planters and like the drones. But I yep. think it's super interesting, you know, to see about all this like crop protection product, like research and kind of the on, on farm field trials and the research trials that are done into all of this. Because even like tar spots made it all the way up into South Dakota. And it's yep. probably not going to be long until it gets into North Dakota. And so it's just one of those, those diseases that it's just on the rampage for corn crops across the country. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, um, it's something that we need to remain vigilant of. And, and we do a lot of work collecting on-farm data with our growers. And in the last two seasons, for the most part, outside of southern Indiana where we saw the tar spot outbreak, it's been a relatively low disease pressure um, a couple of years for the majority of my territory. But even in the absence of disease, we're still seeing uh, a yield boost from those fungicide applications. And I think a lot of it is attributed to uh, maintaining that plant health, uh, reducing stress, maintaining healthy green plant material. We know that anything that we can do to extend grain fill is ultimately going to help us preserve yield. So um, I think that's a good story to remind folks as well, even in the absence of tar spot, um, something to chew on. <laughs> Well, and that kind of leads into, you know, kind of my final question is, you know, what in your area, you cover a wide area, a lot of variability in soils and climate, I'm sure. But, um, you know, what are kind of the yield expectations and what do farmers shoot for uh, as far as on corn and soybeans, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. So it's hard to give uh, any any particular number, given the fact that I cover anything from uh, beach sand to Champaign, Illinois, beautiful black dirt. <laughs> So um, there's going to be a wide array of numbers that I could throw out there, but I will say based on what I've seen so far, um, I probably shouldn't give a number, but I would say we're going to be on par with our regional averages. I think that we're going to be pleasantly surprised, particularly with the corn, assuming that we can keep getting these rainfall events. Um, we've got a lot of corn that hasn't yet reached tassel, so there, there's a lot you know, still hinging on the weather events that come with, with us reaching those reproductive stages. Um, but I don't think we've lost a lot from planting late on that corn. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we did, we, we are probably losing out on top end yield potential with our soybeans. Unfortunately, since most of our stuff did not get planted early, a lot of it was ap after that May 15th um, time frame. But again, we know how, how dependent soybeans are. Uh, uh, yield, I guess I should say, on those late season rains around, around August and early September. So when they're filling those pods, we need, to, we need to hope and pray that we're getting those rainfall events to fill those pods. And I think, I hope we're going to be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your insights. I think that's going to about wrap it up for today's episode of From the Field, our latest offering from FP Next, of course, powered by John Deere. Thank you, Madison, so much for joining us and kind of sharing what you're seeing in your neck of the woods. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And, of course, we want to thank our listeners for listening and watching to this latest episode. And we're excited to bring you farmers from across the nation during this growing season. So, uh, you know, Madison, I'm sure we'll have you back on sometime and, and talk a little bit more and catch up a little bit more on crop conditions uh, down the road. Sure. Anytime. And then, of course, don't forget this is a video episode. So if you're listening on a podcast platform, jump on over to Farm Progress or YouTube where you can see our bright, shining faces. And be sure to come back next week for our Shop Talk episode of FP Next. We'll be diving into the life of a legend at Farm Progress, Tom Beckman himself. This is going to be a great episode with Tom, our Farm Progress Midwest Crops Editor. So, you know, most of our listeners and readers know Tom pretty well. Um, I've heard he's got some really good updates on his region for us. So you'll be want to be sure and follow FP Next, uh, you know, on your favorite podcast platform or, of course, at farmprogress.com. Absolutely. And we wish everybody a safe and prosperous growing season. And remember, if it's our culture, your friends at Farm Progress have you covered. Here's wishing you high yields and good weather. We'll see you next time.